Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to today's webinar, Spring Refresh. My name is Lynn Mattis, pronouns she and her, and I work in the alumni office at Mohawk College. As you transition to life after college, as a graduate, the Alumni Relations Department is here to support you and help you stay connected with the Mohawk community, whether it's through events, communications, alumni benefits, volunteering, and more. It is now my pleasure to introduce our facilitator for today's webinar, Sylvia Bozanak. Sylvia is a 30 plus year veteran of the interior design and kitchen and bath design industry and is principal of Canfield Interiors, Inc. She is a graduate of both McMaster University and Mohawk College. Her industry experience includes a partnership with a land development company, as well as a 10-year dealership with Elmwood Fine Custom Cabinetry. Sylvia has acquired invaluable experience as a land developer, builder, renovator, project manager, designer, kitchener, and bath designer, and stager. She is a highly regarded guest speaker and judge of numerous design competitions, both for the National Kitchen and Bath Association and the Ontario Home Builders Association. Sylvia is also a world traveler who combines her two passions, design and travel, to bring inspiration to her work and her life. So welcome, Sylvia. We are so excited to have you here today and how fitting on such a lovely spring day today to be talking about this. Thanks so much, Lynn, and uh, thank you, of course, to Mohawk College for uh, giving me this opportunity to present to all of you today. So welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us, and uh, I hope that you're going to find the next hour exciting and informative and absolutely inspiring so that you can go out and do a few things around your place, uh, whatever it may be. So it's... Uh, with a spring refresh in mind, as Lynn had said, it's a spring day. It actually feels a little warmer out there and actually feels like spring today. So we probably will be a little bit more excited about doing some spring refresh around our spaces. And just as far as it, the uh, question and answers uh, that we are going to address that at the end of the segment, so, we can uh, have about 15 minutes at the end. The presentation isn't going to go the full complete hour. And there also is going to be a slide at the end of the presentation with my contact information that if there are any other further questions or comments, you can email me. And uh, there's also a phone number if you need to, or if you felt that you wanted to reach out to me. Okay, great. So we have all the results in. So I will go ahead and share those results. So we see that it's really interesting, you know, 60% of the people uh, want to do, are interested in doing a mini makeover, 50% want to declutter, no surprise there, and 20% of those watching want to do a major renovation. And I think that it's really important, and we're going to go through the process of, uh, in, of decluttering. So that's really great. These are things that I ask my clients all the time. You know, what is it that they need to do uh, around uh, their spaces? So I'm going to stop sharing that. Okay, great. Thank you. And we have one more question for you before we dive in. So the second question is, which rooms or room in your home are you focused on? Select all that apply. So feel free to select more than one. Um, we have kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, living room, basement, outdoor space, and other. And it's really interesting that, you know, with the renovations that are happening, the major renovations, the kitchen and the bathroom tended to be the most common ones, but there were a lot of people doing outdoor spaces. And we'll talk about that in the presentation of why that area became so important. I think the most important thing is that we've been able to spend some time in our houses due to what's happened the last two years and we've been able to really do an assessment and say, wow, this either needs a little help or a lot of help. So, okay. And the results. So, so we see, buried. yeah, they are. And, you know, actually, I'm a little surprised that, you know, bedroom is 50%. Uh, it's usually it's kitchens. 
bedroom is 50% and the next one tied or basement and kitchen at 40%. And then we have bathroom and living room and outdoor space all at 30. And other, now that could be, you know, a laundry room, a mud room. Those are all the spaces that also, you know, people think about need some updating or just some, you know, a little bit of a mini makeover. So good to know. Great. Well, thank you everyone for participating in that poll and I will hand the mic over to Sylvia. Okay. So let's just get underway here. So let's just talk about what we were just, you know, in the first slide, why this presentation? And so first of all, it's really about, here's the things that we're gonna talk about in this presentation and touch on and go into greater detail. Is this a, a major renovation that you're looking for or is it, uh, we're thinking more about makeover tips and a little mini makeover. Regardless of what you're doing, the most important thing is to start always we're thinking about your space and what needs to be decluttered. And we're gonna look at how you can do that and what is a, a really easy way. People seem to be so overwhelmed with decluttering. We're gonna talk about what are the paint colors for 2022? What are the trends from the various major companies in, in the paint industry? And of course, what are the renovation do's and don'ts? I think that that's really important because there's a right and a wrong way. And uh, so often people go down the wrong path. So let's just start with makeover tips. I have kind of four key things that I talk about when I say I'm gonna do a makeover or I'm gonna start process that this place needs a refresh. First and foremost, as I mentioned, declutter. Then the second part of that is once you've decluttered, rearrange. And again, that's uh, important because we're gonna get into the little bit of the tips of how to do that easily. Lighten up and then that means just not I don't mean don't stress out about lighten up. I mean, lighten up your, your space and infuse color. So those are kind of the things. And that picture really shows where colors infuse. It's light, it's bright, it feels fresh. It, spill, it feels very springy and not heavy. So why declutter? Number one, because it frees up valuable spaces. I can't tell you how many times clients have asked me to come over and they say to me, I need more closets. I need way more space. First thing I do is I go to the closet, I open it and I stand in front of it and I said, what's in here? And most of the time they look and like, I don't know, I haven't any idea. So the, I said, well, your homework for the next couple of days a week is to go through that closet and to declutter it. And that way we can free up valuable space. And the thing that freeing up valuable space does and decluttering does is it actually makes us feel better because the clutter adds chaos and it emotionally and physically actually affects us because we can trip on things when there's a big mess of stuff. I've seen that happen. You know, people because I keep meaning to put that pile away and or I keep meaning to get rid of those stacks of, you know, old magazines, whatever it is, because the chaos, that visual chaos, just really tells me a lot of times the state of mind of where people are at. And again, it does good if you, you know, declutter and you give your items to a family friend, you donate. It does, you know, it does the space good, but it does everybody in the household good. That's just an example, you know, just about organizing things. So I have this like kind of declutter 101. So people say, what do I begin? How do I begin? I usually create three piles or three separate things that you want to do. One is you want to create a pile where you are going to keep it and possibly recycle it, meaning or upcycle it. Does it need to be, you know, maybe it's a spray paint, you know, it can look a little better. It can look a little fresher. I love spray painting, you know, wicker. It just gives something a new look or a piece of furniture. Can I donate it to charity or can I donate it to a family friend or a, a family or friend? And last is to dispose of it. If it's really in bad shape and it's broken, 
And, and then of course, break that down. Part of it, can it, can it go in recycling? You know, what part is plastic? I mean, it's not about taking it and throwing it in, you know, the, uh, so that la it ends up in landfill. Before donating, always look at the pieces and go over it and, and wash it and make sure that the stains are removed. If it's badly stained, don't, don't donate it. And also mend it. If there's a small hole and, or if pieces can be fixed in some way, then make sure when you are donating that it is in good quality because at the end of the day, somebody is receiving that, want to make sure that it, it looks good. Make sure that the pieces aren't broken or there are pieces missing. You know, I think a lot about toys when you're giving toys away to, to people or a donate, you're donating toys, making sure that all the pieces are there and because it could be dangerous if it's cracked or it's broken. And my kind of rule of thumb is, you know, when I talk, I always say to my clients, edit, edit, edit. And I try to do that every spring and every fall when we have the change of the seasons, it just, just make it a habit. And also make sure that I say, if you haven't used it in two years, the reason why I'm saying it's two years is because of COVID. Usually it would be a year if I haven't used it in a year, then it's time to either donate it and use that rule of thumb, but use that as kind of a guideline. So what can you donate? And I've donated all of these items. Uh, cars, and I'm not talking a brand new car, I'm talking a car that actually, you know, uh, can be boosted and can and and can and still runs, but maybe the body's shot. Uh, when I come to uh, electronics, appliances, housewares, furniture, light fixtures. You know, of course, as, as they're not broken, there's been a lot of brass light fixtures that have been donated, and it's real brass. I see this all the time. Tiles and unopened paint, as long as the paint is. You know, it hasn't hardened, obviously. It's still in good quality. But maybe change your mind on the color. Toys, books, and sporting equipment. Some of the biggest things that are, are donated at, or given to a friend because, you know, I, my kids were major skiers and they grew so fast. I was constantly donating their skis or handing them down to friends. But there is no way that there was going to be taking up valuable space in my garage. I wear a lot of sunglasses. Shoes, again, as long as they're not, you know, really badly worn. Clothing is probably one of the big ones that people donate. And household goods. And so that's just some of the things. Now, where to donate? Here's a really great list. And again, I have donated to all of these. And so diabetes, declutter.diabetes.ca. And with diabetes, they take clothing. That's, there's, all kinds of things that they you can donate to diabetes. Habitat for Humanity. I had two renovations for clients that I did last year and their stoves were still in good working condition, but the style was not really what in keeping with what we were doing. And we called Habitat for Humanity, ranged a time, they came and picked it up, gave the client a donation. It was perfect. Salvation Army. I've donated sofas there. They again came and picked it up. Goodwill industry, that's everything from clothing, pretty much. Hacking optical, I haven't done that particular one, but there is quite a few people who donated sunglasses and eyewear. Best Buy, a lot of electronics. They will also take old batteries. Kidney core. So that's the one a friend of mine had an old Audi that was kind of on its last legs and uh, they came and they picked it up and towed it away and gave the, the person a, a receipt. Tiny toy company, Furniture Bank. Furniture Bank is a really good one. Most designers that I know is, they use it a lot. There's a lot of you know refugees and there are a lot of people coming into Canada who are starting new and there's uh, a lot of designers who help out at Furniture Bank and they actually help people plan a space and so lamps, uh, whatever it is that could possibly set up um, a space for um, someone who's in need. And then of course, just your local place of worship or your family, you know, there's always a nearby church or, or someone somewhere in the area that is going to be able to help someone who's in need and especially today with uh, 
the situation that we are in, and we're seeing a lot of refugees coming in and displaced people, especially with the war in Ukraine, that people are going to need whatever they can to set up a, a, a home. So when I talk about the, that second part of those tips, you know, we say declutter, now we rearrange. So now we've refreed up all kinds of space. And maybe we had a piece of furniture in the corner of our room that now we've donated and now we've got a new place. The first thing I do say, how can I rearrange this furniture in this room so it can look different? Don't always keep it in the exact same space. Maybe I take another piece from a room, another room and I just regroup it, I rearrange it. The other part of rearranging is rearranging your art. I always say to my clients, that piece of art is not cemented to the wall. Let's take that piece of art, put a new frame on it, maybe a new mat on it, and put it in a new place in your house and put it, maybe regroup it with other pieces of art. I've had that happen in my own house. I had a major piece in my foyer and I moved it to my downstairs. And friends came over and they're like, when did you get that? And I'm like, it was hanging in the living room. Uh, and so now with new surrounding, it looks completely different. So that's a really inexpensive way to regroup and your your furniture and just have a, a new look that makeover uh, that I'm talking about and also what about rearranging your accessories you know sometimes we keep the same thing on the on the mantle or on the table regroup them and in, in accessories you know we're always in grouping in odd numbers of uh, threes and fives and that's so important to just rearrange that because it gives it a fresh new look so these are just some of the inexpensive ways that you can re rearrange things and get a fresh look. And then of course, paint. Paint is probably the most inexpensive way that once we've rearranged, we can uh, look at doing. So the other part of, of once you've rearranged and we talk about the bottom uh, one there is to infuse color with paint, but to lighten up and think about spring. So. You know, even today, you know, I've got my bright pink spring colors on. I, I just feel so much better when I'm surrounded by really bright colors. So when you think spring, think light, bright, colorful images of spring and summer and incorporate some of those colors into your space. You know, Mother Nature didn't get it wrong. It, it really got it right. And if you're looking to think about what colors can I combine together, just look outside for inspiration. Nature is our biggest inspiration. Also, lighter weight fabrics, when I say lighten up. Put away those heavy blankets and heavy duvet covers that we've been buried under for the last, you know, how many months because of winter. And start bringing out lighter, lighter weight fabrics, lighter weight duvets, uh, lighter weight throws that are bright in color that just make the space Look, Terry, you can have a very neutral sofa and change it up with colorful pillows that don't have to be expensive. There's so many places you can find great uh, pillows today at reasonable cost. And then of course, what about lightening up on the furniture? Paint pieces that were painted, maybe had a, a dark piece of furniture that's th throwing a, a, showing a few dings in it. And maybe it's time to, to get a, a colorful paint and paint it. Painted furniture is still really popular. And also incorporating pieces of furniture that are light. So glass, acrylic, acrylics made a big comeback. So that again, you see through it, 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 it just feels lighter, having a colorful carpet on the floor. So those are the kinds of things that I talk about when I say lighten up and change it with the season. And as I said, infuse color always. And it could be one wall or it could just be if it's not paint, it could be just in your throws. There's a prime example of what I'm talking about. On the left is the picture of what we think about winter, heavier blankets, darker colors. And on the right is your typical, you know, lighter weight fabrics and colors of orange and fuchsia and pink and red. You look at that color and it's just, it makes me happy. So a few minutes ago, I talked about, you know, looking outside for inspiration. Nature's inspiration is the biggest trend that we're following right now, not just from the design community, but the suppliers of, you know, Caesarstone and Cambria, which is countertop material, the paint industry, 
we fabric industry, everyone is taking their cue from nature. This picture here is a picture actually while I was on safari in Botswana, Africa, and it is the prime example of the African landscape. You've got all kinds of varying degrees of green. You've got the, the, you know, the earth and you've got the bark of the tree. And you think about, and the, you know, the kind of that gray blue of the sky. When we look at colors today, it is no wonder that Benjamin Moore, Seiko, uh, Sherwin-Williams and Bayer, some of the top paint companies chose green as the color of the year for 2022 because they have been looking, like I said, at nature's inspiration. So these are just a couple, we're gonna go through a couple of design examples. On the left is Benjamin Moore's color of the year called October Mist CC-550. Very, it's a, almost like a sage green, a lovely color to work around. We'll see another example of that. And on the right is Sherwin-Williams paint color for the year, which is Evergreen Fog SW9130. It's a little darker and it's kind of got a little bit of a grayed out version to it, but both fabulous cover colors to live around. Green is such an easy color to live around because it's just really soothing and really calming, again, coming from nature. There's an example of October Mist on the left, the Benjamin Moore color, CC550. And putting it with lilac, Lavender looks fabulous. We've got a, probably that, that, that antique white, I think, on that. I'm not sure what that one is, but I often use uh, one called um, White Down. It's one of my favorite whites. On the right-hand side is the Evergreen Fog. There we've paired, they've paired it in that particular photo with some, you know, black, some, you know, brown, kind of a copper color. Again, an antique white. It looks a little on, on the like kind of almost like a country setting, but all of it is again imparting a feeling. But how easily green works with so many different colors. When I talk about nature's inspiration, I think about this photo here is showing us natural materials: wicker, copper, brass, some terracotta. I think of sand and rattan and beach stone. All of those colors that are in that photo work so well together, especially one of my favorites, which is that mustard color and that pale yellow. Mustard is such an easy accent color. Uh, I use it quite often. It's like kind of my go-to color when I want to infuse a bit of oomph into a space. And these are some of the things that you're seeing in the color trends from both Benjamin Moore and Sherwin-Williams for 2022's color palette. And I just listed a couple of the, the ones that they had, Sherwin Williams had listed for 2022. SW9104 is woven wicker, and we're, we're gonna see two examples of that. SW9109, natural linen, a very light, creamy beige. And again, SW2857, piece yellow, because yellow is just such a great color. We're going to see a lot of that. So here are the two paint colors from Sherwin-Williams. The one on the left, as I had mentioned, Woven Wicker SW9104. Just a really warm um, color. It pairs beautifully with creams. Again, look at, against the green and the copper color. So it looks fabulous with um, whites. On the right hand side is actually a house that I staged. It's, uh, the color there is highly reflective white, 7757. And that, the reason why I picked that particular white to stage this house, the entire house was painted that white, was because the floors had a lot of yellow in it and I needed a really clear, clean, crisp white, as pure as we could get it, so that the hardwood, and the trim was just would shine and, and showcase it beautifully. And we accented it with, again, the, the yellow mustard color. In this particular photo, we look at how contemporary that looks. That house was built in 1954 and it now was brought into, we did that last year in 2021. And when I picked that color, I didn't know 
that that hydroreflective white was going to be one of 2022's color palette uh, picks. So I'm glad I chose that one because it's quite popular now. The other two uh, colors from Benjamin Moore are the one on the wild, the left called Wildflower. It's 2090-40. That terracotta is such a fabulous color. They painted the chair in it. And it is so sharp with the black and up against the white tile. And you see the terracotta pots it just sitting on the ledge in the shower area. A little goes a long way. They could have done the whole room in that, um, you know, of the walls, but they've really accented that beautifully. Such a great warm color. And Pale Moon OC 108, again on the wall with the paired with the throw and the duvet cover there and uh, a little bit of it on the pillow, but how well that mustard pairs with the pale moon on the wall. As I mentioned, it looks great with chocolate brown. It looks just so great with the natural linen colors. Just makes me happy. Okay, let's talk a little bit about picking paint colors. You know, how do you, how do you choose that right paint color? And there's a lot of people who really, really struggle with this and probably one of the calls that I still get with clients is, you know, spending, you know, two or three hours doing a whole house of picking the right color for the right space. So here's just a couple of tips that are really important to keep in mind. So first of all, I look at what direction does the, the room face, which means how much light exposure does that room get if I'm facing north, south, east, or west? So if I'm in a room that's facing north, I'm not gonna get a lot of sunlight. Uh, the light is gonna be pretty constant. And so it's not gonna be a very bright room. Artists love that room because they love to paint in that environment and that exposure because the color is gonna be constant all day. Now, if I'm facing south, uh, a south exposure, the room is gonna be very bright. East, obviously morning sunlight, sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So a Western exposure room means we're going to get the, the sun in the afternoon and, you know, probably right from two o'clock, three o'clock on. So the natural exposure is important. And why? Because light affects color. Put a paint color in a room and it's going to look different at different spaces in the room, different times in, of the room. So that's why people find it challenging to look at, you know, how do I pick a paint color? So if you've got a really, really bright room and you put a really light color on the wall, it's gonna probably almost appear white because it's gonna be washed out by the sunlight. So keeping that in mind when you're looking at, you know, putting a paint color on the wall. Clients are so afraid, oh, oh, it's too dark, it's too dark. And, 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 and I always, you know, smile to myself because I know that given the time of day it's, and how much light the room is gonna get, the room can handle it. So, the other part of that is how much artificial light does the room get? I see a lot of homes that the builders have done and there's, there's no light in the room, you know? So people have put just a, uh, you know, either a floor lamp or a table lamp, but the room is dark. So you have to take that into consideration. How much light, artificial light does the room receive? What is the room's purpose? How are we using the space? Are, is it a room that is it a kitchen that we're eating in? Is it a dining room? A dining room is a great way to uh, put a paint color. A lot of restaurants use red in dining rooms or in, in their restaurants because red is a color that infuses uh, energy and it actually increases appetite. That has been proven. So, also a lot of chatter it's because of energy. So, a lot of people you know, we'll do, uh, have red in, in the space of a dining room. And if it's, you know, putting red in a, in a room where you want to try and rest and sleeping, not such a great idea, but really thinking about what does the color uh, evoke and how do you react to color? There are certain colors that I say to clients that there are certain colors you just hate, that you can't live around, that you don't like, and keeping that in mind. So again, what is the feeling of the room? is also important. So does the room, do you want the room to feel cozy? Do you want it to feel really cool? Do you want it to feel a warm, inviting feeling? Again, because color evokes a mood 
and it infuses a, a sense of how do I feel in this space? Cheery, do I feel, does it feel really dreary? Does it feel really dull? The other part in that last component about picking paint colors is how large is the room? Now, that is a bit of a trick question because you can put a really great dark color in a bathroom, in a powder room, as long as it's really well lit and it infuses a sense of drama. And you're not in there, you know, it's not like we're spending the day in there, we're in usually in and out. And so just thinking about a space, if a, if a room is a big room and it's got a lot of windows, and it's got a, lo a lot of light, you can put, you know, a really great dark color on there because it's broken up by a lot of the windows. So it's not like you have a lot of wall space and it's getting a lot of natural light. Maybe it's getting Southeast exposure. So that dark color is really brightened up by all of the elements. And the last part of that, uh, thinking about paint color is when you're looking at the paint colors and you're looking at the paint chips, most companies you can you know, look at the color chart and go down the list of them and look at whether or not it does it have a warm undertone and or does it have a cool undertone? So paint the people at the paint store can always help you with that, but bring the chips home and look at it in the space that you're currently picking. Sherman Williams actually has come out with a great um, new concept, which is it's a peel and stick uh, piece of the color uh, swatch, which I believe is like, I think it's either 10 by 10. And you can actually peel the back of it and stick it to the wall and look at a couple of variety rather than back in the day, you know, I've had clients where I've actually, if they were unsure, we painted out a piece of drywall and just moved it around the room. So that's an, uh, an option if you're thinking about not really sure of a color and you wanna see it on a bigger uh, piece other, other than that little tiny, what is it? Two inch by two inch square. These, I've put up two examples of how, with a quick little makeover, it, painting cabinets. And now this is a client's house that I did last year. They had uh, maple wood, the cabinets were still in great condition. And here's the thing, if the, con if the condition of the cabinets is still in good condition, it's not falling apart, they're not cracked, they're not chipped, the hinges are still good, the drawer glides is still good, then you can give it a new look by painting it, changing out the hardware, putting new handles on it, and in this particular case, the client was not uh, very hands-on. So we hired a company or I hired a company to come in and paint it and couldn't afford to change the backsplash. So we picked a color that really matched the backsplash and kept that color basically throughout that space, not a huge space, monochromatic, and then accented with one of his favorite colors, which is that really bright kind of turquoisey blue it's in the carpet, it's in the chairs, it's in the pillows, and a bit of, of black always for just some drama. And again, this is a, you know, a young bachelor space. This is a, a, another kitchen that was painted. This is painted uh, with Benjamin Moore's advanced paint. The client's husband is incredibly you know, handy. And so he actually, I gave him the process of how to do this. He painted those cabinets himself. On the left was the kitchen before, maple cabinets, really dated because it had that kind of a pink undertone, which has done its time. And on the right, by painting out those cabinets, we did new backsplash, new countertops, brand new uh, knobs, you know, new table and chairs. Eventually they changed out the fridge and it just gives it a fresh new look. And this client had a wedding that was taking place daughter was getting married and so really didn't have the time but what a what a difference and everybody who came in thought she went and got a brand new kitchen so and updated the lighting also the other part I want to talk about is what about paint for the exterior and the spring is a great time to thinking about you know painting once it warms up painting in the you know as as the fall as long as it doesn't turn very cold. So you've got a long time where you can pick some paint colors for your exterior. So often I see a drive by and the garage doors are painted these really bright colors. And I must say, I roll my eyes because the, the garage doors are not the focal point. The focal point of the house, the calling card is the front door. And in this particular case, 
you know, the, the, here's where you, the color is picked from. The guiding, you know, the guiding points here are the bricks, the mortar, the window trims. And I take all of those elements into consideration, the roof color. And this is where we're going by. We want to infuse the, an impact color. That particular color, that's a Sherwin-Williams color. I just can't remember what that one is. It was done a couple of years ago. The color is pulled from the brick. And the garage doors were redone. And the color of that was matched to the color of the mortar so that it blended in. And we've accented again with some floral material. And it has an impact of having, as you drive by, your eye goes directly to the front door, which is what you want. Especially today when there has been so many houses on the market to sell and we're staging houses. The most important thing is you want people to look at your space and you or your or your house and you want them to look at what is beyond that front door, that calling card. So make sure that you accent the front door. And again, use those elements for guidance. And most importantly, make sure that you're picking the paint colors outside and holding them up against the brick, not looking at the paint colors inside. That's, you know, that's not going to help at all looking at the paint color at different times of day, that particular kitchen, that particular front door at the front of the house faces west and so gets the afternoon sun. So what does it look like in the morning when it's in shade? And what does it look like in the afternoon, end of day, what's in, what's in uh, full, uh, full view? And just an easy update is just update the lighting. On either side, we added in a little bit of the copper by updating the, the sconces on either side of this front entrance. COVID effect. You know, we, we're still talking about COVID two years in, but it really has an impact on how we live and how we live in our spaces. And what I found more than anything is we create, we began to crave a connection to nature more than ever because we were, you know, really confined to our houses for two years. We couldn't go anywhere. And so what, that, what happened with that was we looked around, we weren't feeling good about our spaces. It was impacting us in a negative way and it was impacting us physically and it was impacting us psychologically and emotionally. And because of that, we started looking around and saying, I really need to update this space. It doesn't make me feel good. And so we then started, we saw a big trend upward for kitchens and bathroom renovations on the upswing. People really said, you know, I'm at home cooking. My space doesn't work well. I'm not traveling. It's about time I updated this space. Why not do it now instead of when I put it, my house on the market to sell? Because now's the time I want to enjoy it. Not when I put it on the market to sell. Although you see a lot of clients do that. Instead of taking the time to do it for themselves. You know, I love to cook and I am a kitchen designer. So having a kitchen that functions well and that everybody can join in is really, really important. And then we also saw a movement towards rural areas. People were moving away out of that concrete jungle and were saying, you know what, I need a bigger space. I want to have more room. So we saw a lot of people moving from the condos to places where they could have more green space. That was a trend. And we also saw people moving to cottage country and buying cottages because they said, you know what, if I can't travel and I don't know what's happening, and we see now the war in Ukraine, people said, you know, I'm going to buy a little cottage, I'm going to fix it up and maybe do a little mini facelift on it. And then maybe that's where I'm going to retire. I'm going to sell my big house in the city and move up north. The other part of the COVID effect was the idea of I have a backyard, I'm going to fix my backyard up. I'm going to make it function so it's a place for me to relax and enjoy. And I can't have a vacation, so I'm going to have the term stay at home and a stay at home vacation, which became staycation, which all became a part of our vocabulary, whether we liked it or not. But having a great space that you could sit outside, you know, fabulous. So this is an example of a facelift I did for a cottage um, actually on Lake Rosso. 
that cottage is only 867 square feet. Client didn't want to tear it back down, but really wanted to make it functional. It's not even winterized. So what we did there, brought my team in, and we started by uh, painting all the paneling out. We then painted all the cabinetry, did a new countertop, changed all the hardware on the cabinets. We put a new uh, countertop on, new appliances. We also did a new front and back door. Didn't change the windows up, but put blinds on that those windows, which made a huge difference. We also did uh, all new flooring, ripped out that old ugly carpet and put LVT, luxury vinyl tile down, which wears incredibly well. If you have pets or dogs or kids coming in with sand, it's just the best thing. We did a new furniture uh, as well. And again, new lighting. We upgraded the lighting because the old fixtures just didn't work. And that's the after. There's the LVT on the floor, the luxury vinyl tile. We painted it all out. We added in. We actually strapped that ceiling to make it look like a little bit of a coffered ceiling, added in some new lighting, um, and uh, accented with that lovely yellow, that mustard color, because actually there was a fireplace there, and the fireplace was uh, in a metal painted in that yellow factory painted. And I went, wow, this is just perfect. This is going to be, that's my point of inspiration. And was able to fit in a sectional. And uh, kind of first said, you'll never fit it in. Just everybody congregates uh, on that sofa. So amazing. There's blinds on that uh, window that we um, installed. Staycation. So if you're planning an outdoor it doesn't, it, you know, I've done everything from planning backyards for people who have, want to have, you know, a, a, fr a, a fridges outside and having high end appliances. So I use DCS, which is uh, an outdoor line that actually can withstand the snow and the ice and the elements with the pool, but it's about planning the outdoor space. And I think about an outdoor space just like I do an indoor space. I think about what is it that I need to accommodate? How am I going to entertain? How many people do I need to seat? How often am I entertaining? So in this particular space, we've got a barbecue area that is right off the kitchen. The kitchen is in this area here. We've got a couple of little different vignettes depending on how the sun, this backyard gets full sun. We've got a area here right beside the barbecue that's built in. So you can either set food on there or just it means it makes it easy when you are barbecuing. And we created, like I said, little vignettes, plenty of color, areas to lounge in and sit in. That's just another shot of it. We've got that bright color and we've created we created a bench in that because they entertain quite a bit. We've got some, some umbrella fabrics, which is really important because some umbrella fabrics are, you know, mold and mildew resistant. They withstand any of the rain and elements. You know, you can leave them out and don't have to worry. Also, too, I like anchoring little spaces, just like I do an area carpet in a house. Those are polypropylene. You can get them at Home Depot. You can get those from uh, Costco, and they're fabulous. They, you know, if your deck is, is getting a little worn, it actually, you know, hides any of the imperfections. But more importantly, they're so great. They're really lightweight. You just, you know, rinse them off if they get a little dirt or sand and mud on them, and then just roll them up. They're just, they're so inexpensive, but they're just such a great way. They come in so many different patterns and colors. I mean, that particular is coordinated, obviously, with, uh, with the dining set there. And also thinking about how much sun does the backyard get? You know, you always want to have a space that has, you know, an umbrella for shade. Nobody, I don't think, ever wants to sit in full sun. It's not great for us. So having little spaces where you can get away from the sun if it's too hot. So having an umbrella or having, you know, trees that give you shade. In this particular space, we've got shade from that those trees that actually overhang so in the summer. So it gives it almost like a canopy effect. 
but it's about inducing color and making the space feel, you know, fun. Let's look, talk a little bit about renovating and what are the do's and don'ts of renovating. My, you know, I have some big pet peeves about when things are not done properly. And I see, because I've been in the construction industry and the build industry for so long, when I see things done incorrectly and not to code, it just makes me crazy. So first of all, when I talk about that, I keep in mind that it's so important to hire professionals, check their references, and make sure that you plan, plan, plan. Because if you don't plan properly, then you waste a lot of money. And when you waste money like that, because you haven't planned and you rush and you make mistakes, it, it, it's really dollars lost. Uh, when it comes to budget preparation, make sure that you plan your budget and you think about it realistically. I usually give clients ideas about how you can spend money and where it should be spent and you know what realistically things cost today clients ask me that all the time and there's always a high a low and a you know in a kind of a mid range consider covid effects which means everything is going to be more expensive today to renovate materials costs have gone through the roof and also to finding contractors to do the work it's really tough to find people who are good are busy and so you can't expect to pick up the phone and find somebody to do it next week. You have to plan when you're going to do that. And sometimes if somebody's really good, you know, if you're willing to wait, then wait for the people who are really good at what they do. They do. As I mentioned, always obtain building permits, especially if you're doing any kind of, you know, you're moving a wall or you're creating, uh, doing work outside, upgrading your system, your electric, electrical system, important to do that. So those are just kind of the, the kind of my go-tos of renovating. Think about the function of the space as well. Just a list of some of the things that, you know, are in, that we do tend to renovate and are worth renovating. Again, the kitchens and bathrooms, as, as I had mentioned, storage is important. A home gym, whether it's just having a space that you can do some yoga, it's just a wellness space. We talked about new windows and doors, always money well spent. Storage, I find most people want a mudroom and a laundry room that functions properly because those are hardworking rooms, get those organized. And as I had mentioned, a backyard, your staycation. And those are all places that really add value that in your house that are worth spending some money on doing right. That's a client's house I did a number of years ago. We, you know, built in the cabinetry around it and uh, everything there is neatly tucked away. So a great space that they use constantly. That's actually my home gym. I've um, been an avid runner for years. So having a space that I can stretch out and do some weights and it has good light and I've added in some mirrors there and it's got great ventilation. So for me, uh, having a home gym is really about wellness. That's so important and great music. Just a little bit about uh, spring maintenance and how important that is. So, you know, when it comes to your roof, making sure that before you start any renovation, you're checking, you know, is your roof leaking? Done a lot of clients' homes, kitchen and bath, I mean, bathrooms and bedrooms upstairs. And first thing I noticed by looking up that the, the roof is leaking, you can go outside and look at your shingles. Are they curling? Are they cracked? Are they missing? So that's usually a cue. And, uh, you know, windows and doors. If through the winter that's been, you can feel a draft coming in, then maybe it's time to change those. And the spring is, is a good time to do that because it's only going to add to your heating and AC cost. Appliance maintenance, a little goes a long way. So one of the things that I often tell my clients when we're renovating kitchens, get some new appliances, is to make sure that they're vacuuming that condenser coil at the back of the fridge. It gets a lot of dust and dirt uh, caked onto it. And that, afford, that actually will you know, lessen how well that fridge functions over time. So if you want your appliances to function better and lo last long, do the maintenance on them. L like I said, little goes a long way. And especially your air conditioner before you, you know, shoot it up or start it up for the summer. Uh, make sure that you've, hopefully you've covered it through the winter 
you've taken it off, you've cleared out all the twigs and branches and stones that may have been blown in there before you fire it up. The other part of that is you can always hire um, a HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning company to come and do annual maintenance, making sure that before you start your AC and your furnace in the fall, it, that it's working properly and that it's maintained. Making sure that you're changing those filters in your furnace when it's the fall, you know, every you know, couple of months. And when it comes time to, if you've done a big renovation, making sure that you're cleaning the ducts you know, especially right after you've done a renovation because you're blowing all of that debris and dirt throughout the, the system of your house. And if you have a humidifier or a dehumidifier, making sure that those filters, again, are, are cleaned because that's air quality and that's really important, especially if you've got pets, you're gonna see a, a big noticeable change if you, you, if you do this maintenance. So just a little bit of a recap, we've got about 10 minutes, we can answer some questions. And that is, please don't underestimate the value of decluttering, to do that semi-annually at least, making sure that you do the maintenance because it goes a long way in how your uh, appliances and things perform. And again, the most important thing is to edit, edit, edit. My clients, you know, I tell them, I just give a, a look at something else like edit. And they know exactly what I'm talking about. And then in this particular case, you see a little laundry room there. I just installed one of these recently for a client. It's a washer and dryer in one because it was a small space. Put some cabinetry around it. That's not my picture, but that is, you know, just an example of what can be done. So it, it's just so great to have something organized. So just before we get to our question and answer and we start answering the questions, I just want to say this is uh, my contact information, how you can reach me. You can, uh, there's my phone number, which is my cell number. You can find me on House, on Instagram. I have a YouTube channel and my email address, Sylvia Bosnack at Outlook.com. So thanks so much, everyone, for listening. I really appreciate your time today. And again, thanks to Mohawk College uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk design, which I never say no to because I'm so passionate about this business. So hopefully we've learned a few things. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, so we do have a few minutes left. Um, if you're able to stick on the call um, for a little bit longer, so we will get to those. So. We have a few. Um, so the first question is, uh, when it comes to living long-term in company-owned rentals, what are some do's and don'ts for refreshing um, and modifying your space? Do you have some good bang for your buck tips that don't involve structural changes for kitchens with poor covered um, slash storage space? So, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I can say, you know, that's really inexpensive, um, that you can do if the, you know, if you can't, if you're not in position where they'll let you paint the cabinets, then sometimes, I mean, I always say if you can paint them great and, and it's in good condition and it's something you can do yourself, awesome. But sometimes uh, one of my favorite things is changing out the hardware, changing the knobs. It's like putting on, I always say that's the jewelry. And it's amazing how, wow, it all of a sudden looks so different. It's like having a great outfit and just changing the color of your you know, putting maybe something fun on it. There are so many new, there's so many storage ideas, like Ikea is my go-to. That actually was there for a client's basement. Uh, we did a little mini kitchen in a client's basement the other day. And I went to Ikea and I, I can't believe this. The stock was like, there was hardly anything left on the shelves. So here's where I'm saying, if you're thinking about doing something, grab it now. But Ikea has so many great items for storage. That's not expensive. Oh that you can easily put up, just make sure that you're checking the load, right? And making sure that you're, when you're putting it in, you're going into either a stud. So you can do that. You can also, again, if the carpet doesn't look really great and it's looking a little, why get, no problem putting another area carpet over another carpet. So I've done that for years. You know, the carpet underneath is a little tacky looking. They're not going to replace it. Get a great colorful carpet and put it over top. So again, changing the lighting, putting in lighting. It's amazing how you can change your space. I mean, I when I was first married, I lived in the, the most 
hideous looking apartment. They wouldn't let us paint. They wouldn't let us doing it. And it was, I think I got really creative by painting some cabinets and or some pieces. So there are ways around it. Amazing, thank you so much. And thank you for that question as well. Um, the second question is, how do you best organize closets that have recessed space on either side of the door? Both, in this case, both bedroom closets have double doors and about two to three feet of space left and right behind the walls. You know, sometimes I've actually, and again, if that's in someone's house, sometimes what we've done is if those doors are impeding, you know, you and you've got wall space, you can take those doors off and you can actually, you know, put uh, the, like the barn door that goes across that slides out of the way so that it gives you better access. Um, there are also sometimes, again, I look to, you know, I measure, 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 and I go with my measurements to Ikea, to companies who focus on, who have, there, there's so many organization tools uh, or organization pieces, but it's about measure the space once it's empty and look at how, you, how you're gonna set that closet up. What do I access uh, continually? You know, is there, do I need a shoe rack? What do I need that for? And I look at again, but if it's hard to access, look at can those doors be removed and, and you know, Closets are, I don't, I hate the standard closets and houses. I, I, when I design and redo a space, I make the cabinetry, the custom cabinetry, the star of the room, because most closets are so useless. So maybe sometimes I've even seen where clients have been able to fit a small dresser, take the doors off, fill a smart dresser in there, put a mirror on the back and access it that way. So get creative, I guess is what I'm saying. And, and that, this is way. Look at how there's tons of pictures uh, if you're stuck on examples. Sorry, go ahead. Next, what's the next one? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question is What do you suggest for a house with windows only on one side facing southwest? So, no windows in the bathroom. So, having a southwest exposure, you're pretty lucky because you're getting, you're getting sun. And I don't know how big that bathroom is, and I don't know. Um, if it's a main bathroom, but one of the biggest tricks when you when you want to enhance a space, mirrors. A mirror is a trick that designers use all the time. It doubles the space, it enhances light. Put a mirror where opposite where there's a window, and you're going to get you're going to bounce more light into that space. My other thing there is also too is always remember if there's a mirror and you're placing it somewhere, think about what you're going to see double of. So. If you're, if you're a messy person, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna see double the mess. One of my big, let me just say this, one of my biggest pet peeves is seeing a mirror above a fireplace because all it does is usually catch the ceiling. That's all you see in it. So think about where you're putting these mirrors. So a bathroom is a great way to actually expand the light and the, and the space. Okay, wonderful, thank you. So the next question is, and I think these the last few will be fairly quick. Um, what about refinishing wood cupboards rather than repainting, which is a great question. Absolutely, you can definitely do that. The big thing about that is because wood has made a huge comeback, it's uh, important to do the prep. In everything that you do, it's always about the prep. So sand, first of all, cleaning it, cleaning the, you know, cleaning the cabinets of all the grime you know, washing it or cleaning it off, sanding it, and then, you know, looking at, uh, I always test what kind of wood is it? So have a sample somewhere that you're gonna test what stain color you're gonna put on there. And certain woods take stain differently. You know, maple's a very hard wood. Oak, you know, is softer, so it takes stain um, a lot easier. Maple, Sometimes putting a really dark color on maple because it's so dense, you'll see it comes out a little blotchy. So if you're at a paint store and you're gonna think about staining, you know, restaining the wood, then think all of those things. What type of wood and, and how dark do I wanna go? So, you know, just about again, the prep is everything. And then, var you know, what kind of varnish? Do I want a high sheen? Do I want a satin finish? 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, another question, what color should you paint shutters on the house? So I'm going to go back to that one slide and you're going to, what's good about this is you're going to repost this so people can, you know, if they, there was information that they missed, they can replay this and it'll be on my YouTube channel as well. The shutters again are, do you want to make that an accent color? So the, it's almost like, it's like the eyebrow, it's focusing on those windows. The windows are the eyes of the house. And so if you've got a really, I try to keep it to just three colors, the roof, the brick and, and the trim, and then I incorporate those colors. And if I'm putting an accent color on my front door and I want the shutters maybe to tie into the color of the roof, it depends on, you know, the brick. It's like fabric. I go by houses sometimes and I think great design. There's a great house designed beautifully, but they put the wrong, like the wrong fabric on the house. Like, it, so it really takes away. So if you're stuck and you're, you're not sure, hire a professional that can help you because you've got one chance most of the time to do the garage doors and picking the brick, especially if you're building new houses. But I would say in that particular case, if you want it to blend into the window trim um, and say your window trim is a light cream and you want to blend in. So I don't know what the brick color that is there, but the brick is your brick or your siding is, you know, the telltale sign. And now Sherwin-Williams has come out with the paint that you can actually paint siding, vinyl siding. Um, it's called Vinyl Safe. So just an interesting to think about if you want to change the look of the color of your house. I mean, please don't paint it pink or blue because unless you really want to be noticed. So anyways, okay, what else have we okay, got? Okay, great. Thank you for those tips. Um, all right, we have a couple more questions. Um, how difficult is it to remove popcorn ceilings and is it worth the expense? Okay, so let me say this. Um, it isn't that difficult um, to remove. Um, it really isn't. There are companies now who come and actually it's a kind of like a sander and it's got a kind of like a bag on and it catches everything. It isn't that difficult to remove. You know, I sometimes I would say it's messy if you're trying to do it yourself. So usually I would say hire somebody who knows what they're doing. The second part of that that people don't realize is the reason why popcorn ceilings were so popular, or they call them also knockdown ceilings where there's a sanding, is because drywallers, um, if you're not a great drywaller, or you've, you will, once you take down that popcorn ceiling, you'll probably see every joint line, especially builders who have, who were in a hurry. And so a lot of times what happens is they take that ceiling, that popcorn ceiling down, and now they see every joint mark. So the joints and the drywall. And a lot of times what ends up happening is you have to, we call it, put a skim coat on it, which means put another coat of drywall uh, mud on it to cover those imperfections. Just know that. It's just not a matter of sanding it. So you take that off. You probably have to prep that. It's not like it's a big job. Um, but, and maybe you're thinking, okay, now I'm going to put in some recessed pot lights. So great time to, at, while all of that's peeled out and you, you're putting holes in the ceiling anyways, think about what you're going to do all at one time. So. Great, thank you. Um, and one last question um, before we wrap up. Uh, what do you think about plants on shelves? Yeah, I think plants are really important. I, I can't say enough. I, I took the slide out because we were really long, but in the last presentation that I did for, for McMaster, we had, I did a whole slide presentation just on plants and how important they are for our environment because you know it takes out the carbon dioxide and they're just really good for us to have our plants in it. and I think having real as opposed to silk uh, you don't have to be great with plants I mean I'm not the best at taking care of plants and there's lots of tips on how to but it adds color and so it's a cheap way again to decorate and infuse color. Uh, so a yay and a thumbs up to real. And not to mention if you've got a little space, sorry, but to, to add in some herbs, fresh herbs, what a, what a wonderful, you know, having a smell of fresh basil or rosemary. And then we use them. 
I'm a cook, so I love to have fresh herbs in the house. So twofold. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think we've tackled all the questions. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We really, really appreciate you taking the time um, out of your busy schedules. And a big thanks again to you, Sylvia. Um, as we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to share about the work that you do um, in interior design? Yes, sure, sure. I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, the, with the 30 plus industry and years in the industry, people ask me what kind of design that I do. And for me, it's uh, kitchen and bath design, it's whole renovations. And I not just do Hamilton, I travel, my client base is, you know, Mississauga. It could be a two hour consult for, you know, a paint, or it could be, you know, how do I renovate this space, do a lot of uh, rearranging spaces. And it's really about what does the client need? You know, I love this business. I'm still passionate about it. And I think when, I, when I'm tired of it, I don't know if I'll ever get tired of it. I love to share and help people make their spaces better. And this idea of it, you know, I'm a very collab, I love collaborating. So this idea that it's only my way, I, I believe that we can, you know, I love working with people. So let's collaborate, I'm pretty easy to get along with. So. I like helping people. That's, I love creating spaces for people to say, wow, I can't believe that for, you know, this is what this, this space could be. I mean, we didn't have to spend a lot of money. So design does not have to be expensive. It doesn't. It's not about the size of the space. It's what you do with it. So um, people can call me or reach out to me if they have any questions further about, you know, what my bill rate is and, um, um, I'm happy to answer any questions or have a, you know, a consult with anyone. And I do do Zoom calls. So if people want to have a little bit of a call, we can do an hour consult over the phone, over Zoom. Fantastic. So. Thank you. And uh, thank you again for such an informative presentation, Sylvia. Thank you. I think we're all walking away with a lot of, a lot of new information and some inspiration. So thank you again. Thank you. And again, thanks to Mohawk. Um, you know, enjoyed my time and I learned a lot from the courses that I took there. So thanks again to Mohawk and all future uh, alumni who are writing exams and, and getting ready to graduate soon. So always a pleasure.